Today we have invited Natalie Winters in here. She is the co-host and executive editor of uh, War Room. She has some thoughts about the infiltration of the American academic institutes by the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, Susan is completely preoccupied with the with the CCP. And I thought it'd be an interesting conversation for us to get into. Uh, also a question of whether or not the DOJ is hiding vital information on human trafficking. I've been sort of confused why the human trafficking topic is anything other than something people would want to get into and support efforts to interfere with that. You can watch or you can follow uh, Natalie at Natalie G. Winters on Twitter. And I will review with you uh, after the break some other concerns we have uh, about our YouTube channel uh, and where you're going to have to watch the next couple weeks of show after tomorrow. We'll see you right after this break. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. There are three steps to great-looking, glowing complexion in the summer. Of course, apply sunscreen, stay hydrated, and use the amazing skincare products from our friends at Genucel. Most retinol creams are not recommended for sunlight, but Genucel's Ultra Retinol uses a powerful plant extract retinol. It's an alternative called Bacuchiol, which helps the skin stay hydrated, smooths out fine lines, without harsh side effects, and it is safe to use outside under your sunscreen. Genucel works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. And Susan and I love Genucel so much, we created our affordable bundles at up to 72% off of our favorite products at genucel.com slash drew. And just for the summer, every subscription includes a customized summer spa gift box absolutely free. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at genucel.com. See what's in our bundles. Get ready to show off your summertime skin. Go to genucel.com slash Drew. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash D-R-E-W, genucel.com slash Drew. And remember to use the code Drew at checkout for extra savings. I suspect you've seen Susan and I gushing over Paleo Valley products. We love the taste and how well they fit into a paleo-based nutrition regimen. They're delicious and we use them for travel all the time. But there is more. We are huge fans as well of Paleo Valley's grass-fed bone broth protein. It comes in three flavors, unflavored, vanilla and chocolate. It's a powder you can add to really anything. We add it to coffee literally every day. Smoothies, baked dishes, or just hot water dissolves really easily. The bone broth protein is made with 100% grass-fed and finished bones that are free from pesticides or antibiotics and are slow simmered to extract as much collagen as possible. As we age, collagen breaks down. That's what wrinkles are. And research shows that there are significant benefits to adding a collagen source in your diet. I don't think it's too much to say it's changed our lives. And Susan is now reporting that after drinking the bone broth for a few weeks, her hair is stronger and longer and nails are stronger too. Try it for yourself. You can order at drdrew.com slash paleovalley and use Dr. Drew at checkout to save an additional 15%. Hey, welcome everybody. I'm trying to sign out of Twitter spaces here and for some reason I'm having one heck of a time. Uh, it looks like so. Twitter is plot. Twitter is having an issue because it just closed the space out. So I'll get a new one running in just a minute. I'll send it to you. Aww. All right. Well, that explains why I was having such a difficulty. <laughs> I don't feel quite so bad about okay, it. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, as I said, we're bringing Natalie Winters in here. You can follow her at Natalie G. Winters. She's a writer and a journalist, and she has some ideas about the um, perhaps not so... Um, commonly discussed behaviors of the Chinese Communist Party, which, uh, Susan, this one's for you. I know. Yeah, so let's bring Natalie right on. Now how to make a woman happy. Well, you happy in particular. Natalie, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for having me. So Susan, my wife, has become um, 
What's the what would be a good way of describing your preoccupation with the Chinese Communist China Party? I I actually studied Chinese history at UCLA and I it was very difficult to understand and I got horrible grades doing it but I took the advanced class and just it was brutal but you know I couldn't get that A or B let's just put it that way but it is a very complicated world in China. I always wanted to learn about communism in Russia and and I wanted to learn about the foreign you know, the Middle East and China, because I, it was just too confusing for me. I, I came from Newport Beach, and I didn't know anything about anything when I went to college. So, but China really, I've been waiting for probably like, maybe 30 years for something to really happen with China. And I was worried for the last 30 years. So um, I have, that's my background. That's why I'm so interested in it. So that's all I can say fixated emily barr says i think that's a good <laughs> fixated does not quite capture the emotion around her she is fixated but i would say uh, i have instincts a that bit exorcised i have instincts gets, i'm not a conspiracy it would be too far to say paranoid but not not yeah. that much farther off the mark but uh, natalie what, what are you observing it's it's i i've been hearing rumors of the infiltration of uh, academia uh some of the behavior of academia has become uncanny and uh you know i i always worry about looking for the witches casting the spell, so to speak. I'll explain that in just a minute. But uh, what do you what have you observed? What have you seen? Sure. Well, Susan sounds like my kind of gal. I'd say you're, you're a China <laughs> hawk, as am I, but more precisely, a Chinese Communist Party hack. And I'm happy to talk and really dive into academia. But before we get into that, I think it's sort of important to contextualize what exactly influence and infiltration campaigns look like when they're emanating from mm -hmm. Beijing, what exactly the Chinese Communist Party is doing, because a lot of times, and frankly, this is why I got interested in this field to begin with, you know, politicians, media pundits love to throw around the idea that someone is compromised by China. But I really wanted to dig into what that actually looks like, how they actually achieve that, or is that just sort of a meaningless, you know, throwaway talking point that you hear way too often. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for the sake of the country, and I would argue the sake of the world, really, uh, it is very true, but it, it, it's true in granular detail. And what I mean by that, um, I want to drill down on something called the United Front Work Department. Uh, it's not a conspiracy theory. Our own government here has issued extensive reporting on it, um, filed various documents and reports on what it exists to do. And even in the Chinese Communist Party's own words, uh, it really is their political warfare department. Um, and, and again, to take mm -hmm. one more step back, you know, when we perceive of warfare, I think most people think of kinetic warfare, right? Boots on the ground, ships, guns, tanks, ammo, bullets. But there are, at least in, you know, this day and age, there are a lot of different forms of warfare, psychological warfare, information warfare, media warfare, biological warfare. And in the case of the Chinese Communist Party, they're waging all of these forms of warfare concurrently, I would argue, but specifically, on the kind of personnel front and how they really can subdue or subvert a country without even actually having to take it over, which one of the guiding axioms, it's one of the most often used quotes in the People's Liberation Army's military code, is that the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And what you see, I think, in effect here in the United States is really that. So to go back to what's called the United Front Work Department, this is sort of the key, really the, I would say, major axis of what all of these various foreign influence groups that have very nice, innocuous, friendly sounding names. These are the groups like the Confucius Institutes, the Institutes, the China United States Exchange right. Foundations, the Chinese People's Association for Friendship and Foreign Contact. And while they might have nice sounding names and missions, in reality, they exist to identify and target elites, whether they're in academia, media, think tank world, politicians themselves, um, and compromise them through a variety of means. Most times it's through money, I would argue, it's through blackmail, um, but really what they want them to do and what we saw, I would argue, really to be the first stages of the Chinese Communist Party's efforts to infiltrate this country is really just to get the country, but more specifically our thought leaders, to buy into the narrative that China is not a competitor, but rather they're an ally, they're someone that we should trade with. Uh, that we should have an, a free exchange of goods and students and professors and scientific research. And frankly, I think we need to look no further than the example of COVID-19 as to why that's not a good idea. And I don't just mean because of what happened at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, 
But a lot of the mainstream scientists that you saw people names like Peter Doshak, that's the leader of the group EcoHealth Alliance that was receiving money from Anthony Fauci to work on these bat coronaviruses. He was also one of the leading voices in the mainstream media saying that anyone who dared to say that COVID-19 originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that the conspiracy theorists, what they were saying was absolutely crazy. And if you really run down his resume and see the kind of groups that he had been affiliated with, he had been doing studies, taking Chinese Communist Party cash, working with these united front groups. And I think that's sort of an example of what we call elite capture um, by these Americans who certainly so, are Americans. So let me, let me, yeah, sure, sure. I yeah. talked for a while. Let, let's pause. I will give you that. No, no, it's good. I love it. Yes, hey, let's pause. Yeah, let's pause on Peter. Of, she packed it all in there. Peter Dayzak for a second. <laughs> uh, and, and that is, I, I we are going to talk to an attorney uh, that hinted that he has a series of FOIA documents that, I don't want to use a stronger word as prove, but maybe it suggests that Dezak may not, in fact, be compromised by the Chinese Communist Party so much as a the head of a counter espionage operation through EcoHealth Alliance designed to keep an eye on what the Chinese are doing. What do you think of that theory? Well, I would say that Peter Doshak has been really the leading defender of the Chinese Communist Party in the mainstream press. People may be familiar with the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. And of course, they put out a statement in the early days that really was used by all the mainstream media outlets that they cited as saying, because all these eminent doctors and scholars said that COVID-19 developed naturally, anyone else who says otherwise is lying. Um, and Peter Doshak really has continued uh, to peddle that line, even despite being forced to recuse himself later from the Lancet COVID Commission because he never disclosed his ties to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, I mean, that is a, is a theory, in, in my opinion. I really don't think it's 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 valid. Um, I would also say on that. What's, Peter what's interesting? Really, let me uh, yeah, let, sure, let me just sure. hold you for a second. I, he, he would behave this way. <laughs> you know what's weird about this guy is he would behave this way if he were compromised, and he would behave this way if he were a counter espionage operator. Both both states would explain the bizarre behavior, but in either case, I will I will completely co-sign the what you're saying in the sense that when is our government going to stop lying to us, and under what conditions? That that is one of the most disturbing aspects of the last few years and i'm still struggling with that in in either case they're obfuscating information would that that would be accurate correct yeah and i think it's sort of a a fog of war maybe in this case you know fog of biological war uh scenario right we don't know what exactly his, his true motives are but i think either way it's bad because you either have someone who is compromised by the chinese communist party who throughout COVID has continued to push for international collaboration on the world's most dangerous pathogens with the Chinese Communist Party, including doing work with labs that are run by China's military and work very, very intimately mm -hmm. with them, or even worse, and frankly, why there is maybe some credence to what uh, your, your lawyer friend was saying, um, is because the United States government has endorsed a scientific collaboration with Chinese Communist Party from the get-go. It was all the way back in the all early right. 2000s that Anthony Fauci and his deputy director actually signed memorandums of understanding to begin really the process that would lead to basically U.S. taxpayer dollars going to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But it goes back, frankly, to what I was saying in the beginning, which is if American people and frankly, our, our thought leaders perceive of the Chinese Communist Party as an ally, right, as another global power on the world stage, as opposed to a, a country, a regime that wants to systematically destroy and replace the United States as the global hegemon, well, that leaves you with two very different interpretations of whether or not we should be collaborating with them scientifically. Right. Well, I, and to be, again, I push back a little bit. I mean, at one time, I don't think it was so clear that we were in trouble with them. And I could see how they could have gone down the path, particularly on the medical and biological side. There was a lot of sharing of stuff going on uh, in medical research at one point. And uh, all of a sudden, there's been a giant uh-oh certainly since COVID. Uh, I spoke to Li Meng Wan a couple of times. Are you familiar with her? The, the uh, doc, yeah. And she, um, 
she has repeatedly uh, alerted us to what was going on and what she was doing and what happened when she started asking questions. Do do people not fully appreciate? You know, I don't want to get too dramatic or too hysterical right off the top, but but this is a government that has killed millions of people uh, and has no problem making people disappear. And I don't think this country understands, although we've certainly been going through a wave here where we understand how damaging our own government can be to our own lives, you know, our, our careers, our ability to, you know, <laughs> withstand assaults from social media. And they, they, they've really seemed to be all in on hurting Americans if they're not completely capitulated to the government policy. That is the beginning of uh, what happened in China. Talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, there's a wonderful, well, scary, but wonderful clip from, I believe it's about two years ago, and it's Charlie Munger, who's obviously a close friend of Warren Buffett, big Wall Street guy, huge mega donor, actually to the Republican Party, but he's giving an interview, I believe it's with CNN, and they're talking about how the Chinese Communist Party handled Jack Ma. People may be familiar. He's the founder, CEO mm -hmm. of uh, Alibaba, though he is a member of the Chinese Communist Party, I would say he's sort of like an Elon Musk-esque figure in that he does have some autonomy from the Chinese Communist Party. He's sort of been, I think, a, a thorn in their side because he does represent a little bit more, you know, a drive for, for free markets and, and capitalism that the Chinese Communist Party and their, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics doesn't totally uh, vibe with. Uh, but Charlie Munger in this interview, again, sort of, I would argue, representing the American elite, when he's asked about how the Chinese Communist Party handled Jack Ma, whom they basically disappeared before he reemerged a couple months later, but stripped him of his company, stripped him of a, of a lot of his, his earnings and businesses. He says, oh, the Chinese Communist Party handled him exactly right. What they did, we should be doing here in the United States. And that's not a paraphrase. That's virtually a, a direct quote. It was one of the most jarring moments of television I'd seen in a very long time. But I think that this sort of gets to what is frankly, the more damning and really, I think, scarier aspect of the Chinese Communist Party influence and infiltration angle. And what I mean by that um, is that I don't think that the Chinese Communist Party is, is no longer content, or rather just content, with influencing how Americans perceive of China, right? That's sort of the Confucius Institute uh, attack, right? The, the soft propaganda in terms of reforming how Americans view China and view the Chinese Communist Party, which, as you were alluding to, has been very successful. But I think what we're really seeing here going on in the country right now is not just elite compromise, but really this concept of elite merger. And what I mean by that is that is we can, you know, we can sit here and ridicule and castigate the Chinese Communist Party for how they treat their own people. But and there's of course varying degrees of it. But I think that we're starting to see some of those tactics, the politically motivated indictments and impeachments and targeting of political prisoners and censorship, whether it's from big tech platforms or the collusion with the federal government to do that, I think there's really some, some hallmarks of the Chinese Communist Party's totalitarian ruling system. I think COVID exacerbated it, uh, but I think there is a level of ideological compromise too going on here with our Western elites, where frankly, I think they look at the Chinese Communist Party, the power, the authority, the control that they have, and they envy it. I mean, just look how they acted during COVID. Uh, didn't really seem that, you know, freedom, liberty, and not sacrificing those in the name of public safety and, and danger, as Benjamin Franklin sort of said in a you know, little more direct, but probably more concise way, uh, was really the guiding principle of, of our ruling class here. They were more concerned, I would argue, with stripping us of our, our rights and powers that are vested in with us through the Constitution. You know, um, I thought I recently saw Charlie Munger say he made a mistake with Alibaba. So I think he's rethinking his position. But are you making the case that he was, he was compromised talking on the, by the investment? China? I think he was talking on That's the investment true. front. Yeah. That's true. So what what is it? What is it? He felt that the Chinese Party did right with uh, Jack Ma. That they basically disappeared him because he was going up against the regime. That doesn't sound like Charlie Munger would be in favor of that. That seems. I'm, t I'm telling me. you, it's the most it's the most ridiculous clip. I'll send it to you after the show. We when Steve and I saw it, it, we, it was the cold open of our show for like two, three days back to back. Okay, please, please That's do send it. it to me because it is. I it is. Uh, I, I hope. I hope it's an, a glitch in an old man's uh, operating system <laughs> rather than something he really believed. Natalie, uh, uh, 
so, mail it to me and I'll, I'll yeah. embed it on the website. And so for people listening on the podcast, sure, sure. I'll embed this. It'll be at drdrew.com slash 725-2023. And Caleb, stay right there. As long as we're, we're talking to you for a second, we have had some issues with YouTube lately and uh, uh -huh. we are concerned that they are going to take away our channel or give us a strike or something. And so be a strike. because of that, while we are out of town, which will be the next couple of weeks after tomorrow, we are going to turn Kelly loose on Rumble. Mostly next week. There you go. Uh, are we going to go out to Rumble tomorrow also, or are we going to be able to uh, interview Dr. Freeman together on YouTube? Do you we know? don't the have The beginning a show of the show. The, or when, well, oh, wait, tomorrow's Wednesday. Yeah. I'm yes, sorry. The, yeah. the beginning of the ahead. show, we'll, we'll broadcast the beginning of the show on YouTube, but then cut it off before anything okay. even slightly controversial is broadcast on YouTube because they've made it clear that they do not want any any medical information, anything on their platform. So, so we have repeatedly reached out to them. We have complied with everything they've asked for in terms of rejoinders and qualifiers on everything they've asked for. Uh, but now they seem to be rattling a saber that suggests more trouble ahead. And so, particularly when I'm not here to buffer things a little bit, we're going to send. Dr. We're going to let Dr. Dr. Kelly fly free on Rumble. It's going to be Dr. Victory unplugged on yeah, Rumble. Yeah. So also, if you're on YouTube, like us, like our show, so we get positive vibes. We want to keep the channel. We want to keep coming back. But and, and Drew wants to be here to make sure that you know his. It's his point of view too. And right. And we're we're not able to really maintain any kind of balance necessarily. I'm not going to say. Kelly's going to go off the rails or anything, but, no. but we want her to be able to speak her truth. And, um, and then we can also defend her honor. And then there's plenty of time for YouTube to respond to us. I, I'm, we're not saying that this is a, you know, a done deal. It just alarmed us to the point that we were like, Hmm. Yeah. We want to, we want everybody to be sort of fluid among Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and, and if you, and rumble, because if, if anything happens to one of the channels and we get, we get sort of manipulated and uh, we want to be able to have you aware that there's other places to go and you can find the links at drdrew.tv. All right. So let's uh, keep an eye on that and hopefully uh, doctors conversing and disagreeing on YouTube will be something they'll be interested in maintaining as opposed to censoring or uh, eliminating, but it's a strange time. You're a young person, Natalie. Did you ever imagine you would be living through something like this? Or is it as a younger person, you just could have flexibly go through things and not really appreciate how extraordinary the present moment is? You know, honestly, I, I didn't. I, I grew up, I was obviously involved in politics, hence I, I ended up where, where I did. But I always thought that, you know, the threats that we would be facing, you know, in the words of Turning Point, which is sort of a, a youth conservative group, you know, it was big government sucks. That was sort of their strap line. And I always thought it would just be sort of Republicans versus Democrats, maybe the Uniparty versus everyone else tackling issues like tax policy. I never thought that we would have to amend big government sucks to, you know, big government and big tech and big food and big pharma and big ag all colluding together to censor anyone that says something, you know, that they don't agree with, um, that they are now the apparatus that we're up against. Um, because it's so, I think, antithetical to what this country was founded on but like i said you know what sort of got me interested in the first place is you know in all of this and this investigative journalism was you know the, the why um we see america i would argue every day slipping more and more into a sort of authoritarian totalitarian style government um i think modeled pretty nicely after the chinese communist party um but no i i i really didn't i was telling you i grew up in los angeles um so i i never thought i'd be working where, where i am now uh, but i really think i know everyone every day has probably always said oh i can't believe we're at this unprecedented time in history just like you know they say every election is the most important election in your lifetime but i i do think that those are, are valid charges to be to be saying now uh, because i really do think not just the, the fate of the country hangs in the balance but life as we know it the ability to say things and not get you know, deplatformed and demonetized. Right. Uh, right. It's yeah. weird. It's uncanny. It's mm -hmm. uncanny that other people believe they have the privilege to tell other people what they can discuss publicly. That's a, that's a stunning, stunning and profoundly narcissistic position for people to take. Uh, did you see the um, censorship here? Of course you did, uh, where RFK spoke, and then there was a move to censor him. Uh, what are, what are these p 
people thinking? Do you have any idea what that was? I it was so uncanny to me. It was almost uh, like comedic, but but people are quite serious. What what are they? What is the thinking behind that? I mean, it's it's so in your face, and the irony is lost on them, right? Trying to censor a censorship hearing, but I think frankly, it just shows you how power hungry, but I don't even necessarily know if they need to be power hungry because I think they already retain a lot of the power. Um, these people are, they're, they're never okay. And I think it goes back, you know, really to the fundamental example that I had always seen and experienced even firsthand, which was sort of analogous to college campuses where when conservative speakers were coming, right, people would lose their minds, they'd lose their marbles, they tried to shut down the speakers and scream and protest. And I think the fundamental question that I would always ask is, you know, if these people's ideas are so bad, if they're so wrong, then you should want them to be heard. You should want the cameras, you should want C-SPAN, you should want the national news covering everything that they're saying because it'll be so idiotic that it'll drive people away. And I think, frankly, that is both what both enrages everyone, but also where you see the glimmer of hope. Because if what we were saying wasn't true, if it was false, if it was easily debunkable, Right. They wouldn't need a multi million, in some cases, I would argue, multi, you know, billion dollar fact checking industrial complex that is reliant on collusion with federal government agencies, all the way up to the DHS, the CIA, the FBI, the DOJ. Um, if what we were saying was, you know, crackpot conspiracy theories, they would just let it die, right? Because it wouldn't catch on. But I think the efforts that they've really rolled out to quash what is, you know, the new existential threat to the country, misinformation and disinformation, proves that what we're saying is paradoxically all the more true. Susan calls it over the target, right, Susan? That's yes. what you see. It's over the target. That's where the fire becomes intense. Stay uh, strong. Stay strong. <laughs> well, it, it's just mind-boggling to me that people f want to take privilege over other people's speech, that, just, that, that they think that's a good thing or that they like doing that. It's it's It is so so profoundly narcissistic. Well, it's you just were hard. called a quack and a misinformer, a medical misinformer for a really long time. And I was like, this is Dr. Drew. Have you ever heard him talk? Like, he's very moderate. He's not, he wouldn't give medical misinformation. He questions everything 50 times before he says anything. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, it was like almost a joke, you know, when we get a strike or something, we just like, Oh yeah, he's such a bad guy, you know. Well, and there have been plenty of people I've spoken to who I didn't agree with, but now now you're supposed to attack people for not being attacking enough to the person that you're disagreeing with. So now I have to be your attack dog and you have to tell me, you know, it's just it's too but much. But also the other thing that bothers me is the demonetization, which is a it's like being in a communist situation. It's like, well, you're making money off of this and we don't like it. So then they take it away. And it's like, okay, well, what's next? Well, back to your uh, description of uh, the college campuses with people being you know, screamed down and all that. I, I, I'm always just trying to figure out what's going on. And, and you know, thankfully I had a very rich, old fashioned, no longer existing liberal arts education. And I always look to history to try to understand the present moment. And I found myself reading a Lenin biography recently, and lo and behold, early in his work, once he became a so let's call him a thought leader, his policy, his his technique was ad hominem and yell people down. That's it. Don't get into conversations with them. Don't get into arguments. Attack the person and stay at them till you yell them down. And that's what he did his entire career. And that's what he trained other people to do. So back to China, is this something coming to us through them where people are being encouraged to do this? Is this something that just sort of happens automatically in human history? Or are people looking at Lenin's history and learning from it? What do you think? Well, it is interesting, I think, how the ad hominem attacks, although I would argue now in America, I think in 2016, you, you, you called a racist, a sexist, whatever. Now it's like you're a misinformation spreader, you're a conspiracy theorist. So they've sort of evolved that line of attack. But specifically on, on the Chinese Communist Party front, it is interesting. So people may be familiar, but Donald Trump started what was called the China Initiative, which was a, DO, a DOJ effort um, to combat really academic intrusion by the Chinese Communist Party in the United States, as well as 
the Thousand Talents plan, which was sort of the opposite, which that was seeing Western scientists, particularly in America, be pulled over to China and not disclosing that they were receiving funds from the Chinese Communist Party while concurrently taking funds um, from American taxpayers. Um, and one of the foremost concerns of the Chinese Communist Party was getting this effort, this initiative shut down, which at face value was, you know, portrayed, and I would argue accurately so, as trying to stop Chinese Communist Party infiltration, particularly in academia and research. And the Chinese Communist Party, the way that they really mounted a media campaign, and what I mean by that, this sort of goes back to what we were talking about, a lot of the universities that they had been giving millions of dollars to and the academics whose research you know, they had been funding were then the very same researchers who were signing the letters and penning the op-eds and going on mainstream media outlets to decry the China initiative as, you guessed it, racist, as targeting Chinese people, as targeting Chinese Americans, that it wasn't motivated or fueled by national security concerns, but it was fueled by, you know, a hatred of Chinese people. Um, believe it or not, I'm sure most people probably believe it, the Biden uh, DOJ did ultimately drop the China Initiative program because they said it was, as you guessed, racist. Um, they said it was just going after people based on their race, which is, of course, something that we don't condone. But I think it goes back again to what I was saying in the beginning. Having the American people and the court of public opinion perceive the Chinese Communist Party as an ally, as a friend, as a trading partner, as opposed to a competitor, an existential threat, whether it's through kinetic information, psychological media warfare, they're going to be much more, more OK having Chinese Communist Party linked academics come over here into the United States you know, and teach their children, take our research dollars and work in our high biosecurity level four laboratories. Um, then had they not. And I think it's also just important too to, to make the distinction, you know, obviously not everyone who lives in China is a member of the Chinese Communist Party. And those are some of the people who are the most repressed by the Chinese Communist Party itself. But within the Chi within China, you know, not all businesses or state-owned enterprises and not all academics are, are necessarily under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party, but they have what's called Article 7 in their national intelligence law over there, which stipulates that any company, entity, organization, nonprofit, person, you name it, can basically be requisitioned by Beijing, by the Chinese Communist Party to help achieve the ends of the state. And they leave it very vague, I would argue, purposefully. Um, and that's how you can sort of see some of these espionage campaigns um, or, or you name it, but start to happen because, well, like I said, not every person, not every company is you know, a Chinese state-owned enterprise. They're basically dormant uh, state-owned enterprises. They're dormant proxies of the Chinese Communist Party because at any moment in time, the Chinese Communist Party can flip a switch on and make anyone who lives in China basically do what they say, or as you were alluding to, you know, get disappeared, face the wrath of the Chinese Communist Party in whatever form that takes. Uh, Natalie, we'd be open to taking some calls after the break. Of course, I love taking calls. <laughs> All right, great. We'll take some calls. Uh, we're also going to discuss the Department of Justice and human trafficking. I'm I, sweating over here. I know Susan didn't like you. Susan is going to stay up. Well, thankfully we're traveling, so you're going to have to, you're going to forget everything. <laughs> I have um, YouTube PTSD too. So <laughs> she, yeah, uh, the fact that YouTube came at us really got under right now because it I'm feels like all the same stuff, doesn't it? It feels like somebody is uh, attacking your your business they're attacking your personhood and that that is all stuff that is awfully reminiscent yeah, of the chinese it communist like, party it feels weird that we're living through that here yeah, that's just it's, crazy it's that's why it makes you wonder how much of an influence they and you know have we worked so us. hard to get our channel here and and go by the rules and everything and it's like all of a sudden we're not we're not going with their narrative and i it's just like what do we do what do we do and you can't get any answers that right. feels like communism that, right that you, feels you like, just disappear that's, that's right by the way somebody gave us a uh a chat uh what do they call those chats a super chat super chat. Uh, michael yawn why y-o-n they asked they to ask you about him do you know who that is oh rumble rant yeah i do know michael yawn he comes on our show war room Quite often, he does wonderful primary source in-person uh, reporting on the southern border. And he's, I think, responsible for breaking a lot of stories about how Chinese Communist mm. Party spies, um, people who have known terrorist records and terrorist offenses have been breaching our southern border. Um, but he's been doing wonderful real reporting. It's so wild with all the you know catastrophe going on at the southern border. There are like three or four people that I can think of uh, in the journalism world who are there actually boots on the ground 
you know, getting just ridiculous footage and Michael's one of them. I don't know how you stay so calm. If I were younger and presented <laughs> with this stuff all the time, I would freak out. It's one thing, Susan, at our age, it's like, it's bad enough. But you imagine you're 30 or 40 facing this all down and be like, oh my God, why? Let's throw, throw in the towel. Let's expatriate ourselves somewhere. Let's. Um, I've been thinking about it since I was thirty. Let's. Well, <laughs> it's just. Well, yeah, you've been thinking about even it, but now you're witnessing so it. I'm, I'm... Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's. I, I don't understand how you keep a positive it's attitude. Scary. But, but let's that, uh, before we go to break, episode. let's uh, put it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we can do that on a different kind of podcast. Um, but let's um, throw up the upcoming guests. Speaking of our YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Kelly and I, Victory, will be here for Dr. Joseph Fryman tomorrow. Uh, and we'll, we'll, I think, move that show over to YouTube, right? I mean, to Rumble only. To Rumble. And then, yeah. right. And then uh, next, the following Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Kelly will be with uh, David Cat Cartland on Rumble and then Scott Shaw on Rumble. And then the following Wednesday, August 9th, she has one more show she's going to do by herself on Rumble. And then we'll be by back. By herself. I mean, without me. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and and then she she, always, she brings us great guests. See, yes, like she, Kelly, well, she brings in all of our controversial Kelly guests. Kelly and I, I Emily these, work side by side, and but I don't know the. I, she everybody. knows everybody behind the scenes. She was she was censored for so long, and she just made friends with everybody. And her Rolodex is amazing. And we just want to thank her so much. Yes. For bringing these people on. Well, and again, of course, I get criticized for not being tough enough on these people. I have no idea that what they're thinking until I get to them and interview them. Um, and I've learned something from almost everyone. There are two now, I would say, where I was like, mm, this group, pretty much everything they said. Um, I think uh, Rancourt was one of them. I, I was like, I don't really, I don't know. I, 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 something's wrong with that, what he's presenting. Uh, but I, you know, I couldn't attack him. He's my guest on this show. Uh, and we have a lot of interesting guests, including Dr. Lee Meng Yan coming back on August 15th, um, Ivor Cummings on the 16th, Tom Renz on the 17th to come back and give us that. He's the attorney, I said, that has the um, FOIA documents to talk to us about the counter espionage theory. Uh, and Vibeke Menike, I think her pronounced her, her name, who's the Danish author of the study that showed that uh, 4% of the uh, COVID vaccine supply was responsible for 60% of the adverse events. So we want oh to get boy. that report. Hey, uh, Tropical Rocket on Rumble gave us a Rumble rant, $10. Thank okay. you very much. He said, China does a lot of dirty stuff, but more people there have come out of poverty there more than, in, than any civilization in history. And I'm sure there's some some fans. The point is 1% so, has money and the rest are peasants. So give, let's bring And Natalie, communism works there because- Let's bring Natalie back in for a second. So so Natalie, uh, I'm guessing that is a plant. I'm guessing the people follow you around that are representatives of the Chinese no, government. No, 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 oh, no, no. Oh, there yes. are so many people that are from poverty that like communism, it they is, grew up with communism. That's the way they live. It is perfectly reasonable to say that the economic miracle of a partially free market in China uh, helped people rise out of poverty, and that's the, that is not the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party other than allowing the free market to operate. So an operative would say, it was the Chinese Communist Party that brought them out of poverty. Right. When in fact, they sacrificed how many millions in poverty and with starvation, Natalie? How many millions? Yeah, tens 16 of million, something like that? I think it's, uh, tens of millions, the whole yeah. Number, and you include tens of the forced abortions, you're looking at, I think, around 100 million. Uh, I mean, yeah. you're talking you, on the upper Do you end. agree with me that that a that, that but they have a lot of people there is it the case that people follow you around that are from that are rep that are there to give you grief from the chinese communist party that are that are there well, as do, plants do you mean is that, that happening in, in per in in person or uh or no virtually? much more uh, subtly yeah. much more subtly exactly. i mean like we just saw well, somebody yeah Yes, I so I don't I don't know those person that person's in intentions necessarily, right, but I'll not. say there are two right. two of theories not. of the case. One, you know, I as you could imagine, working for Steve Bannon, who has been of course sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party, there is a lot of bots and trolls that are always sort of spewing the Chinese Communist Party's talking points in any of the shows or, or live chats that we do. Interesting. But that's what I, also, that's what it felt like. But from an ideological perspective. Right, and what we're talking about these sort of mental influence campaigns in terms of portraying the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party is 
the savior, the financial panacea to the economic woes of the people that they're very responsible for suppressing them and subjugating them to such horrible levels of poverty um, and, you know, killing all their family members because they have nothing to eat. Um, right. That's you right. know, I could also see how someone would genuinely believe that because everything that they were taught in university and high school and they see in the mainstream media um, depicts the Chinese Communist Party as sort of this economic miracle. So, you know, they're a member mm. of the World Trade Organization. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if people genuinely believe that. I would argue on very, very, very false and uh, propagandistic pretenses. Um, but nonetheless, I think that's a, a perfect example of true misinformation. And yeah. tropical, rock, tropical rocket apologies. Uh, depending, on what, I have no idea what your motivation is. Of <laughs> well, course, I just was playing that. But, there might but, be some fans. But he's be right. that as it may, uh, he's correct that it brought more people out of poverty, except for the tens of millions they killed. <laughs> so it, it's you know, it's yeah, like, Mao's idea wasn't so good. It, after it's all, the free it? market. They, they and a lot of those millions that were killed, and it happened when whenever the economies get centralized, it happened in Stalin's Russia too. And it was the U Ukrainian disaster that my family was running away from. And these were starvation events. Michael Malice has a great book about this. All right, let's uh, take a little break as I promised. Uh, we'll come back, take some calls. A lot of you have been asking for more information about how to counter the adverse effects of the spike protein from COVID infections and the COVID vaccine. The spike protein is not your friend, let's just say that. So I'm glad we have the wellness company Spike Support Formula as a sponsor, especially since renowned internist and cardiologist Dr. Peter McCullough, who's also chief scientific officer of the wellness company, is one of its champions. There's some very intriguing research around natokinase, which might be a way to take on the spike protein. Listen to this. So start, if you would, with talking about natokinase, how you got to that and where you see its application. So with the viral infection or the vaccines, the spike protein stays within the body and it's found in the heart, the brain, the vital organs, and it's causing problems. The Japanese have been using this for heart and vascular disease now for 20 years. It's safe. It is a form of a mild blood thinner that it dissolves the spike protein nearly completely. Spike support formula is the only product on the market containing natokinase, dandelion root, and a host of other antioxidants all showing promise in helping you protect yourself and your family. To order this unique, specially formulated supplement, go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is drdrew.com slash TWC. Use code DREW at checkout for 10% off today. President Trump recently issued a warning from his Mar-a-Lago home, quote, our currency is crashing and will soon no longer be the world standard which will be our greatest defeat, frankly, in 200 years. There are three reasons the central banks are dumping the U.S. dollar, inflation, deficit spending, and our insurmountable national debt. The fact is, there is one asset that has withstood famine, wars, political and economic upheaval, dating back to biblical times, gold. And you can own it in a tax shelter retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. That's right, Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k maybe from a previous employer, into an IRA in gold. And the best part, you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Just visit birchgold.com slash Drew for your free info kit. They'll hold your hand through the entire process. Think about this. When currencies fail, gold is a safe haven. How much more time does the dollar have? Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. I do not give financial advice, and previous performance is no guarantee of future performance. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew to get your free info kit on gold. That is B-I-R-C-H-G-O-L-D dot com slash D-R-E-W. I want to share with you a teeth whitening system that goes beyond merely enhancing your smile. Primal Life Organics Real White Teeth Whitening System offers convenience and rapid results without harsh chemicals. Light. Blue light for whitening. Red light for gum and oral hygiene. And you can just do both if you wish. Works naturally, promoting gum healing, tooth remineralization, gives you a brighter and a healthier smile. Again, no peroxide involved. Consistent usage yields remarkable results. Take this opportunity to transform your smile and at the same time, optimize your oral health. Aim for five times a week for the best outcomes. Discover more about this remarkable teeth whitening system and other products at drdrew.com slash primal today. That again is drdrew.com slash P-R-I-M-A-L. Be sure to use that link for 60% off drdrew.com slash P-R-I-M-A-L. Do it today for 60% off. 
And we're back with Natalie Winters. So we've been discussing the Chinese Communist Party and their ability to infiltrate elite press, um, academia. And there was uh, another t a story, I guess you were reporting on, on child trafficking in the Department of Justice. What, what was going on there? Yeah, this is one of the uh, more wild stories I think that I've ever broken, but it has to do with what the Department of Justice uh, is doing with their website with regards to human trafficking and child sex trafficking, particularly in the child exploitation division. So under Trump, these pages were reformed. Again, this is just, you know, DOJ.gov um, to include a lot of information about child sex trafficking, particularly how open borders allow for easier international movement and transportation of children. Um, and it also talks um, about child prostitution um, and even domestic sex trafficking. So on what was supposed to be the web page where they were listing their focus areas uh, of concern for, like I said, this child exploitation division of the DOJ. Um, under Trump, um, up until May of this year, it listed child sex trafficking, international sex trafficking of minors, domestic sex trafficking of minors, and child prostitution, both with a few paragraphs sort of explaining what exactly it was, how to prevent it, um, signs to look for. Um, the Biden administration actually erased everything on that page except for the first heading of child sex trafficking and then followed up by a story that I put out just about two days ago um, on what was the citizen's guide to U.S. federal law on child sex trafficking, which was supposed to be sort of an informative web page helping you identify signs of child sex trafficking victims and what exactly the criminal violations were. Um, under Trump, up until May of this year, it used to list about five or six statutes from the U.S. Code that applied to the broader crime of human trafficking, in particular child sex trafficking. But they reformed the website, so they took off every single statute except for one, and they deleted hundreds of words, um, specifically paragraphs, like I said, going back really to the international aspect of child sex trafficking. And, you know, we've, we've reached out to comment. The stories have been out for a while, have picked up a lot of traction. We haven't heard anything. They've given no explanation. They haven't restored any of the information. As we always say on our show, you know, make it make sense. Um, and I think this story in the broader context of what Biden has been doing on the southern border, specifically dropping the DNA testing requirements uh, for family unit units and unaccompanied children, at the southern border when they come across uh, either the border itself or various ports of entry. I think it, it really makes you question um, why a lot of the policies coming out of this administration seem to be playing into the hands um, of human traffickers. You know, uh, Adam Carolla, who I still do a podcast with, uh, has a, a way of looking at some of these things that don't make sense right making it make sense and he has a very simplistic not not that he is simplistic but he distills it down to stupid or liar stupid or liar which is it are they incompetent or are they lying stupid or liar which is it and <laughs> it's hard to tell which yeah, it just it see it seems incompetent it seems incompetent I, i'm hoping that's what it is because uh, liar it seems too premeditated but i but i did want to as it pertains to that kind of thing before we go to calls and by the way raise your hand there if you uh, want to get a call in uh, i see a couple of your hands up i will get to you that um that i was li listening to mark changizi again recently as a cognitive psychologist and he was saying you know we've been in a hysteria we've clearly been in a hysteria for the last like six years uh and it has created these cognitive distortions and really delusional thinking I, I i've been i've been thinking it for a long now i'm absolutely clear People, the general public has been delusional to a large extent and COVID just nailed that and he was saying you know uh, this is where witch hunts come from because it's so uncanny as you said you can't make it make sense that you start looking around for somebody to have caused it that's where you start looking for the witches who cast the spell right but he had a really interesting point which was it, this is where witch hunts come from, for sure, and sometimes there are, you know, conspiracies behind these things, but usually it's just the fact that we have thousands of sociopaths and psychopaths waiting to kind of slip in and take control and have their way where they wish, but they can't do it when people have their normal mind. But when everyone is hysterical, 
they can kind of slip right in, uh, and that's where this stuff comes from. That's where these uh, horrible leaders step in, are able to, and people comply with it, and and become the agents of the craziness. And we've seen a lot of that. Uh, you know, when I was somebody was screaming at my the own hospital where I've been a staff member for forty years, screaming at me, "Where are my where are your papers? Where are your papers?" Where are my papers? Is this a border crossing at Germany in World War II? But that's where we. You don't gone. yell that to a Jew, first of all. Well, but I'm a senior physician, and the guys are like a newly hired security guard. This feels good to you. What do you, what, do you have? No judgment. But um, so, what do, what do you do? You agree with that construct, or do you are more of the opinion that there's somebody pulling the strings behind the scene? You know. I think it goes back to context. And I think when you particularly look at what has been going on at the border, um, and specifically that policy that I brought attention to, the DNA testing aspect of it, you know, mm -hmm. lightning doesn't strike the same tree twice. And in this case, I think there are a lot of policies and even frankly, people that have been embedded within the Biden administration who I think subscribe to a very, very, very radical take on gender ideology. And while I disagree with that, you know, if they want to do what they want to do, go for it. But I think what's particularly pernicious about what the Biden administration is doing on the front of gender ideology is how they're targeting it really on children and the youngest of children and the, you know, most kindergarten K through 12 classrooms um, by sort of pushing for these agendas and suppressing parents' rights. Um, you know, you see various Democrats going on media, you know, every day now, I think it was just today, uh, the New Jersey governor saying that they want to make it law that, you know, if a child wants to change their gender and they're in K through 12, they don't even have to tell their parents, the parents shouldn't have to be notified. I think there really is we, a, we a have that. I think we're, I think we're there. I think yes. we're there already in California, but, but yeah. some of these extreme, extreme uh, positions are part of the consequence of this uh, federalist system that we have of states. Uh, and after all, you know, I, I am very supportive of states having their autonomy to do their thing. The whole, the whole idea in the beginning was to form a more perfect union. And I'm going to defend the state's rights to do whatever stuff they want to do, uh, because you know, you can move, you can go to, that's one of the strengths we have. We got uh, game tech here. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. My friend, you're up as a speaker and anyone else to raise your hand. You're on with Natalie Winters. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Drew. There you, um, there you are. I really you appreciate bet. it. Uh, I, I, gotta, I don't want to thwart the conversation in an area that you guys aren't um, talking about. I just popped in, and of course, a chance to speak with you is pretty phenomenal. So <laughs> I'm just a normal, everyday guy. But I, I want to talk, I wanted to ask you your opinion on this because. It, it seems that no one wants to talk about this. And I want to say something sensational, but it's not political. Okay. I just want to make that a point. Okay. That this is not a political statement. Right. Uh, Hunter okay. Biden invested. Uh, so uh, you, everyone's asking about the origins of COVID. Everyone. And that's a highly contested debate. Where, where did COVID originate mm -hmm. at? But no one, no one in the media no one, no politician, no one is asking the company that was paid by the Department of Defense to track these viruses, to contain these viruses, and to find these viruses. No one's asking uh, that company, Metabiota, uh, any of those questions. And Hunter Biden invested in a pandemic response. Okay. Interesting. Well, let's, uh, Natalie, you know anything about this? Uh, I, so I was going to uh, yeah, say, I'll, I'm I'll, actually the one that, that broke that story, <laughs> funnily I, enough. She broke that I, story, I, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, go so ahead. You're talking okay. about... Let me have 20 more seconds. Go ahead. Let me have 20 more seconds. Go this. ahead. So, go ahead. So, yes, please. Uh, the, the, the reason why it's important, it's not because of the Hunter Biden situation. It's because Hunter Biden invested in a pandemic response company since February of 2014. Um, and then one week later, the Department of Defense gives Metabiota contracts, over 200 contracts. Prior to that, they only got 10. Uh, this was after the vice president uh, put in charge his chief of staff, um, Ron Klain, 
in charge of the Ebola outbreak. Metabiota was hired to contain that metabiota uh, or contain that Ebola outbreak, and they failed. You can look at multiple articles, CBS, Associated okay. Press. They did articles about that. Okay. So my question is: is why why isn't the media talking more about this investment instead of Burisma, instead of China, instead of cobalt, and instead of this prostitution and cocaine uh, problem? Okay, fair enough. Let's let Natalie address that. What do you say? What do you think? So oh, I know I know you were joking how I was, uh, you know, having people in the chat ask certain questions. This is a, a perfect question. You've teed it up perfectly because I think I am uniquely qualified to answer this question. Question. I'll tell you exactly why they never talk about it. So I broke this story back in the early days of the Ukraine Russia war, and it was specifically in the context of how Hunter Biden, specifically through a firm called Rosemont Seneca Technology Partners. Um, had invested in Metabiota. You alluded to how they had a horrible track record on Ebola. Even the mainstream media dunked on them for how horrific they were in terms of helping uh, people in Africa suppress the outbreak. Yet they still managed to get contracts from the Department of Defense working on you know, bioweapons. Um, but what was really particularly interesting um, and how we came into it, this was back when I was working at the National Pulse, was that a lot of the laboratories that Metabiota ran, they were actually a network of bio labs in Ukraine. And if you looked at unearthed and really they had been deleted, um, but web pages and press releases about the work they were doing, which believe it or not, was actually Obama had, had praised the work they were doing. This was a deleted press release back in 2010. Um, but that Ukraine was working on the press releases, they said, quote, the world's most uh, deadly pathogens. They were working on plague, anthrax, uh, cholera, like hor horrible stuff and doing sort of similar manipulations, or at least the concern was to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So we break the story. Tucker Carlson um, gives a, it's like plays the story on air. He gives us credit. And literally, I kid you not, within maybe a few hours of that happening, I get the top fact checker from the Washington Post in my Twitter DMs saying, you're like literally accusing me, doesn't know me, you're spreading Russian disinformation. Like, what is it like to be a, a shill for the Russian government? Totally jumping to conclusions when this story had nothing, this was back, so I had done a lot of reporting on the Hunter Biden hard drive. This story had just come because I was going through emails on there and saw the, the connection. And the Washington Post, I had later had a conversation with him between my editor. We worked it out that obviously I wasn't, wasn't a Russian agent, but they still ran with the story. <laughs> so this, this story has totally been tainted as anyone who says it and brings it up. It's Russian disinformation. But doesn't that, doesn't that remind you of how they would behave on every COVID story that didn't, uh, that questioned any narratives? Immediately you are they fill in the blank you're condemned in some way and it takes about exactly. a year it takes about a year for the truth to come out so months. sit tight uh, yeah how long has it been so this was i guess february uh maybe march of 2022 oh so is it so. are people more forthcoming about this now is this a more uh, understood to it's, be a it's more talked about truthful in rendition like, of, yeah it's talked about in alternative media. You know, it's, it's been one of those stories that's mm. gained a lot of traction, but it's, it's it, the, the person who's asking the question is certainly correct, even when the mainstream media does maybe, you know, show a little leg on some of the Hunter Biden stuff when they talk about the Burisma deals, the Romania stuff, the China stuff. They never, ever, ever mention um, how he's been involved and invested in pandemic uh, response firms. They also never mention that he's been involved mm. um, in identity and uh, basically tracking free uh, payment platforms that have been used for cross-border transactions, bet particularly between Mexico and the United States, and that they've even invested in, in Silico Medicine, which is a firm that was developing COVID-19 drugs that is a partner of Pfizer. So those are the sort of, you know, untouchable areas that the mainstream media never likes to get into. You know, as, as we learn more about Hunter's extraordinarily out of control behavior, I, I am beginning to get increasingly concerned for his survival. Uh, he has the kind of addictive pathology that ends in demise by various means. I can think of 10 ways I've seen people like him die. And 
I never heard him talk about recovery. I never heard him speak about treatment. I never, you know, the, he is far enough along in that, the certain kind of addiction that his life is in danger. And I, I don't know, I'm getting increasingly concerned. And of course, if he dies of addiction, people are going to go, you see somebody did away with him. It's like, nah, no, let's be, let's get on the record now that no, he's got plenty of potential of fatality built into the addictive pathology that he has. It's really something. All right, Josh, bring you on up here. Let you ask a question. Uh, Natalie Winters, Josh, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Drew. Hey. Um, so the thing with me is I, I don't want to be the person that says this is conspiracy theories because I think time will show whether or not it's true or not. But the thing that I want to mm -hmm. point to is something that you said about psychology, which is where's ground zero when the paranoia begins and where we're really being scientifically accurate in the way we research these topics and how we speak about them. Because I honestly don't know enough about it to say that, but I do know something about the mind and I know paranoia is very seductive for the mind. Paranoia is very seductive. For it's some. like a drug. It's for like some. it's like alcohol. For some, it's like alcohol for the mm. alcoholic. So for some, right? So I'm not yeah. saying that. This, I'm not saying yeah, that this some. is what this is. I'm not saying that this is what this yeah, is. I don't want to be very clear. No, I, but, I get you. I, I get you. And, yeah, and but I'm wondering. Here's the here's the here's yeah. the piece. Here's the piece. The 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 salve to the wound that we are missing is open, free, consistent debate and dialogue. That that's the the you know fresh air, sunshine. That is the only hope for these disturbances of thought, and we are explicitly bringing down that capacity. We're we're. I mean, like we talked about it an hour ago. It was about you know, a censorship. You're going into a censorship uh, hearing and you, you make a move to censor somebody for spurious reasons. I mean, this is this is anathema to what needs to be happening right now, particularly in circumstances like this. Now, Robert F. Kennedy said another thing too, which is that if the government would stop lying, uh, it would bring people together very naturally. I, I, I've now thought it's yes that would help. I thought that I thought that was a great assessment, but it's also you can't keep censoring people. It, things are not going to get better if people are being censored. Well, Natalie, um, how, how do you not uh, have trouble sleeping at night? I, again, I, your your um, your very similar your composure. Uh, she has a gun under a pillow. <laughs> Sorry, it, it's gonna take more than <laughs> a assuming, gun. I'm afraid. You're assuming With I things... sleep well at night. <laughs> well, do, do, so what do you imagine? I mean, how do how do you move forward? What do you imagine the future holds? What what is your sort of? Do you have solutions? Do you have ideas? Do you have? predictions I, I know it's very i'm not i'm not forcing you to make it i know that's always a very bad you know sort of request for people but i'm wondering if you in your private moments if you have any thoughts about where we're going and how to get there yeah i mean i, I think it's it's not really even a you know hypothetical prediction i think the united nations kind of world economic forum groups of the world the people that subscribe to the kind of global government model are very specific in what they want our future to be. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the cliche, eat the bugs, live in the pods, you'll own nothing and be happy. But more concretely, you know, they want the digital currencies, uh, they want the social credit scores, they want the vaccine passports, they want to interlink your ability to move and really do anything in this world um, to your beliefs. And I mm -hmm. think the other side of that coin is, is the misinformation, disinformation, witch hunt, right, that crusade. Uh, we see, like I said, the convergence of the fact checkers with the federal government and, and big social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So I think the what I get scared about is, is frankly, just when they open their mouths because <laughs> the future that they have in store for us, I don't think they're they're that coy about it. Or if they are, what they are plotting behind closed doors, I'm sure is is a heck of a lot worse. Well, I, I'm I'm very aware of the World Health Organization treaty, so called, where. Um, the uh, health and well-being of the um, granite structures outside your home are going to have equivalent value to your own life and well-being and health. Um, so I, I am gravely concerned about what they're going toward. But it, it's just so confusing to me how people can run toward things like that or feel good about telling other people how to live their lives this way. It seems 
the exact opposite of the evolution of humanity. But I, I, I don't know. I, it, we've been here before. It never goes well. It just never goes well. If, it, if there was any example of it being a, a good way to go, uh, maybe I'd be a little more understanding. But it never goes well. Is it just people tell themselves, well, this time it will be different? I don't know what it is. I, I, I think, you know, that there's sort of a disconnection be between what the people, you know, what exactly does that even mean? Want, I, when I think the people, I think normal people like you and myself, not part mm -hmm. of the sort of Davos elite, right? The members of the WHO, the people who are pushing and benefiting from the extended powers and protections of the pandemic treaty. Um, but it, it doesn't seem like, I and I think, frankly, that's what sort of the, the hidden blessing of COVID was, that in some ways, I don't think that their, their plan totally worked. I think people pushed back. In other words, I, I think a lot of people sort of woke up to what was going on with the vaccine mandates and the mask but Natalie, mandates. And I think that I would, I would say the, yeah. the scary thing, you're right, but the scary thing is, so their response is, well, now we got to really clamp down. N now we got to get this yes. right. And that is the scariest thing of all. Uh, it, it's And people have to be aware that there is <laughs> intent such as that, and they and they cannot cave to it. It, it really is very dangerous. Well, I appreciate you being here. Other than uh, what curious. Caleb's got questions. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm actually <laughs> I'm maybe Susan I'm real tweaking. Quick question. Yeah, <laughs> Natalie, I'm actually curious. Like, where did you? How did you get to this point? There aren't very many people that are in like in our generation that are arguing on on this side of the aisle that are speaking. You know, on Steve Bannon's show. That's I don't know hardly anyone in our age group that are interested in these topics. So, is this something that you studied? Have you been interested in this since you were a child, and now you're into broadcast? or how did you how did you get into this i will i will give the very abridged life story but I, I grew up in los angeles and for some reason within me when i turned 18 and graduated i moved out to dc to intern for steve's old co-host and like i said i heard a lot of people um talking about you know chinese compromise and oh so and so is bought and paid for by china but i've always wanted the evidence i've always wanted to be able to back up anything that i say so because I was working with a lot of people who were, you know, older and didn't necessarily know how to use the internet, it was sort of a, a, a niche to be able to footnote. That's what I always say, a lot of the statements they were making when it came to compromise. But when I started digging and really digging and digging, what I began to uncover more and more, um, it really just blew my mind. So I was then more and more intrigued. And you are right, I am an, an anomaly for my, my age group, I think. Um, but I think it goes back to what you were saying in the beginning, too, is that, you know, I feel like we used to perceive of political differences as, oh, you know, Republicans versus Democrats fighting over tax cuts or abortion. Um, but it's so much bigger than that when you're talking about, you know, the Chinese Communist Party's quest for, for global ambition and hegemony because they're recruiting people from both parties uh, to do their, their bidding. And that was sort of what I realized. <laughs> Well, I thank you for sharing it with us. I, I, I would say that, Caleb, I am noticing a contingent of uh, folks younger even than Natalie starting to sound like this to me. Uh, I'm seeing a fairly and, and thoughtful and smart people, young people, sort of thinking for themselves, quite literally. And that's I, what is required right now. Yeah. I think that they've they've always existed, but they haven't known that there are others out there that are in our age group that are thinking about these topics. <laughs> well, like they, and so they keep well, quiet. Well, no, I think it's a they growing stick thing. On, you know, they, <laughs> they stick with the topics that are popular on TikTok because they don't realize that there's a mm. lot of other people out there concerned with these same issues in our age group. So it's that's mm. why I'm always so interested in like, how did you get here? Why, why did you step mm. outside, I guess, of the boundaries of most people in our generation to talk about these topics? Topic. so it, it's mm -hmm. very interesting <laughs> well we thank you for having done so and for sharing it with us here natalie other than twitter anywhere else you'd like people to head on over maybe to the war room or where would you like them to go yeah you can also find me on instagram and facebook and getter uh and then you can go to warrooms.org and the show is live from 10 to 12 eastern standard time and 5 to 7. all right natalie winter thank you so much for joining us
All right, Natalie Winters, everybody. Follow her on Twitter, Natalie G. Winters. And uh, tomorrow, Dr. Kelly Victory comes on and joins me with uh, Joseph Freeman. Again, we will, might have to migrate that show over to Rumble because we are under an, we want uns free range Kelly. an uncertain circumstance uh, with YouTube. David Cartland. With our Paleo Cartland Valley beef sticks. And August 3rd, uh, Scott Shara. Uh, I think I misspoke on August 9th. I think we might have David Martin in here on August 9th. Um, and that will be me and Kelly. And that will be on YouTube, I trust. And that is what's upcoming. We put that up there again, Caleb. Uh, what's upcoming is uh, a bunch of, uns of not things you can't see on YouTube. <laughs> I told him, I said, look, you know, let's just cut short. And, you know, and then he sends me this, these icons. I go, we, we don't want to be too blatant about it, but um, I think there's a lot of <laughs> anger coming yeah. out of me and Caleb right now. Yeah, it, well, it, I know it's, it's very a lot of anxiety like, about this. If, Talking if anyone, about China has not helped yeah, either of you. Definitely not. So, yeah. so, but if, so, if anything, it's like I have a oh personal, my. I'm personally offended by this. For one thing, it's, it's YouTube. I've been on mm. YouTube for over 10 years. That's where I got my start. So mm. to see the platform that I mm -hmm. love so much, I also, I met my wife through YouTube. Like we met at a YouTube convention mm -hmm. and now we're, oh, our oh, second kids do in October. So long. Oh yeah. So to see YouTube fall this far and then to go in and suppress Dr. Fucking Drew just drives me insane. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't understand it. You're, they can't possibly believe that their moderators are more of an expert on medical topics than someone who's been a licensed physician for decades. That that's just it doesn't make any yeah, sense to me. Yeah. So it makes me mad. It, it, it's not me that they have issue with. It's who I interview, and then no, they, and who so, who you interview, and then the fact that we're getting money and, for and it, and then they have notes on how I should interview them, which that's the part that I think is outrageous, which is, you know, it's one thing if I interview people with outlying ideas, I go, there's other hang on, Susan, hang I on, think hang on, factors. I need to clarify this. If these outlying ideas, and then I go, this guy is right, listen to what he's saying. Oh my God, this is the one and only truth. That's different than me just listening to people and not smushing them because I haven't thought about it long enough. They're my guest. Uh, I I don't have to agree. You don't have to agree. We're just listening to their Yeah, but it's opinions. also like yeah, you got poked by a mediamatters.org, which, you know, they were pointing out all the horrible guests you had. what was the other point you wanted to make? I, the other point is that people can complain about our our YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and it may go into a big bucket, and they go, okay, you've been deplatformed or whatever, but we don't know yet. They haven't responded. So they may come back and go, oh, no, we're so sorry. Don't worry about it. And then we'll be back up. Well, so we are certainly uh, open to direction from YouTube as we've always been. And we will continue to do so. Uh, in the meantime, though, I'm going to send Kelly over to Rumble because I'm not here to supervise. <laughs> and uh, her ideas are not the same as mine, as we pointed out many, many times over the months we've been doing these shows. And uh, we will be back with Kelly and myself tomorrow at 3 o'clock Pacific time. And that is our last show for Susan and I until August 9th. So we will see you tomorrow at we'll 3 o'clock. We'll be on the other time zone of the we'll world. Be on a different time zone. See you at 3 o'clock. Off the, the grid. Mm -hmm. See you tomorrow. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. What usually tears is the frenulum at the base. Okay. That's the thing under the base that tears commonly. Also, you can get tears in the foreskin itself. And the real problem with that is that when it heals... It scars and the foreskin shrinks a little bit. And if that keeps Don't watch happening, shrinkage there. If it keeps happening, the head of the penis eventually can't come out. What happened what happened to me was my head was actually only popping out about like twenty five percent after the tear. Yeah. I was able to actually fully take it out. Obviously I was a
bash at a 15 and it i didn't stop you know having you i know I mean, that's a problem with the man you I love the problem with male he could be eroding his kneecaps off <laughs> right. This is uh, fought we, through. He's like, I, there's a willing woman. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> I don't care how much my dick hurts. Yeah. That is the male, man. <laughs> right. I, if, if ladies want to understand what motivates men, just talk to a 16 year old male and uh, see. Pushing his through uh, a broken uh, frenulum or whatever. Right. <laughs> you know?